on this movie. That's so sweet. Hello, everybody. Hi. How was everyone? How was everyone's night? Good. 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 All right. My name is Ryan Abershami. I'm a senior this year at Beverly Hills High School. Um, I'm the student body president, and I'm going to turn it over to Sean. Go ahead. My name is Sean Tooby. I'm also a senior. I'm the student board member on the Board of Education, and we'd just like to thank all of you, first of all, for coming out tonight. Now, to get into the presentation, for a quick agenda, we just did our introduction, then we're going to get into some background information and history, some of our concerns, then we'll have a quick message from the superintendent, our conclusions and next steps, then we'll introduce our guest experts and get into some question and answer. Now, for our background info and history, first things first is litigation. As a lot of you may know, our district has been in litigation with Metro for about seven years. And in this process, millions of dollars have been spent. And because of that, many of our in our community feel that they no longer seem to care about what's at stake. The court case is still going on. Sometimes it goes in our favor, sometimes in their favor. It's a little bit of a stalemate. But we have to go beyond that now. There's a lot more at stake than just battling it out in court. This is affecting our students, our education, and our learning. The students are now at the forefront of this issue. We've spoken to all the teachers and staff in our entire district. We've held a similar presentation to over 1,000 kids at this school about two weeks ago. And now we're reaching out to all of you, the community members, because above all, no matter what you think about this issue, it is important that you inform, are informed and aware of what's going on. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about Metro's current plans. So this is a little map of Beverly Hills, and Metro's expansion into Beverly Hills, their subway line is called the Purple Line. And the green route was their original route. It was supposed to run along Wilshire Boulevard, then Santa Monica Boulevard. As you can see, it's more straight, more direct. And I drew a circle around our high school, and that green arrow was where the original station was proposed to be on Santa Monica Boulevard. But then, a couple years ago, Metro decided no. Instead, right when they hit the cross-section of Santa Monica and Wilshire, they actually went to detour, go left, and under our high school, some resident houses, and have a station right in the heart of Century City. So as you can tell, this detour route is longer, it, it seems like it's a bit slower, so why would Metro decide to do this? A couple of reasons we've heard from them. Number one, Metro said that Metro conducted some studies in which they claimed that they found some fault lines under Santa Monica Boulevard. And because of that, they deemed it unsafe to have the route and the station go over there, and instead they found a much better solution to take this detour route and, under our high school, and go under our high school. And what we do know is that those, report, those reports did not actually go into like special details about that specific area. They drew some general assumptions based on fault lines in that area. Now, a second reason we got from them is because, if you can see this map, what's different about where that location of the new station is on Constellation Station is that that's in the heart of Century City. And we have had Metro tell us in a public forum that the reason why they also decided to have the station be there instead is because since it's located in Century City, there's more foot traffic. And therefore, they can get more ridership and more revenue for the company because, as we all know, the purpose of a subway is for people to ride it. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, this is estimated where the route will go under our campus. If you can see, I have a little pointer. Right over here is where our tennis courts are. This is the front lawn. This is some of our old buildings, some of our old historic buildings, building one and two, B1 and B2. And this green patch right up here is where the current bungalows or the portable classrooms are located. So this will give you a great image and aerial view of where exactly this subway will be running under our campus. And then if we zoom in a little bit more, this is their staging area. <laughs> the staging area is their construction site where for the next seven years, they will be using this location in order to dig under our high school. This location, this staging area is around 15 feet away from our classrooms, or three arm lengths, and that's approximately the distance between Ryan and I right now. 
So that was some background info, but now I'm going to hit it off to Ryan for some of our concerns. So uh, it's important to know the background information to really understand the concerns that are going to be detrimental to all of our health. Our first concern, well, go ahead. Our first concern are the health risks involved. We are worried about the noise impacts, the vibration impacts, the construction impacts. However, our primary concern is the health and the safety risk involved for everyone that steps foot on this campus. As you can see here, this is a crane or heavy type machinery that is on the staging area adjacent to our campus. Metro has determined that in nine months when construction starts, over 300 diesel trucks will go to and from this staging area each and every day. What that means is students and staff will be exposed to diesel particulate matter. We did some of our research and we found out that our experts determined, or the district's experts determined, that with, with this diesel particulate matter, the cancer risk will increase by 10 times. I want you guys to be aware that this is a two-sided issue. There's the district side, and there's metro side. And Sean and I are here to be as transparent as possible. So yes, our experts do determine that the cancer risk increases by 10 times. But in a little more analysis, we found out that metro disagrees with that claim. In fact, metro determines that the cancer risk will not increase by 10 times, but in fact, by 3.6 times. So you see, this is not a matter of will it affect their health or won't it. This is a matter of to what degree the health of the students and the staff on this campus will be impacted. Gases. Under a high school, there are two prominent gases, methane and hydrogen sulfide. About a hundred years ago when the school was constructed, these gases were still present underneath the surface. Why are we mentioning them? Why are we mentioning them right now? Well, in order to dig a tunnel, you must dig through the ground. And by, and by digging through the ground, we are afraid that these harmful gases will come into the air. Hydrogen sulfide. Some side effects of hydrogen sulfide are nausea, nausea dizzy, dizziness, and irritation to the skin and to the eyes. Our primary concern with methane gas is the explosiveness at low levels of concentration. We are afraid that these gases will rise to the surface, which are not only cancerous, but are also extremely flammable. Why are these gases present beneath our school? Well, before Beverly was Beverly, we were an oil field. Drillers dug underneath our school to excavate oil. Now, in the early 1900s when drillers were tasked with this job, it was not required by the state of California to clean up, to cap, or to map where these oil wells were. And we are afraid that these oil wells have built up high pressure methane and hydrogen sulfide gas. And we are afraid that these gases will come to the surface in Metro's excavation underneath our school. Our second concern, the safety. It is, it is clear that there is hydrogen sulfide, methane, oil wells, diesel particulate matter underneath our school. Oh, and I forgot to mention, there are about 70 to 80 unmapped oil wells underneath our school. So right beneath us right now, there may be an oil well. Who knows? Back to safety. Safety. In 1985, in this Ross Dress for Less store, high levels of methane gas from the oil pots underneath the ground had built up in a storage room inside the store. What had happened was this. People were rushed to the hospital with third degree burns. This is on Fairfax, just a couple miles away from this school. Again, I am not telling you guys this to scare you. As parents, as students, as community members, you guys have a right to know what, is, what there is a potential of happening. Now, we are afraid 
of the gases, the oil wells, <coughs> diesel trucks going to and from the site, but we are also afraid of the heavy machinery that will be going, well, will be staged on this layout area right next to the bungalows. Over the summer, some students and some district personnel had toured the campus and they realized there was a hole in the wall adjacent to our campus. How, how was this hole created? Well, heavy machinery in the staging area behind the wall had knocked the wall over and punched a hole through the, punched a hole through the wall, causing cinder blocks to fall onto our campus. Granted, Metro had been doing demolition over the summer, so there would be a minimal amount of students and staff. However, we are afraid that this heavy machinery will impact us during school hours. We are afraid that a similar type accident might happen when school is in session. Now, I mentioned earlier that, I, that our primary concern is the health and the safety involved. However, we are aware of the noise and the vibration that will impact all of us. State educational guidelines in the state of California recommend that noise levels should not exceed 35 decibels. If we were to exceed this recommended level, the state determines that comprehension will be hindered. Now, Metro promised not to exceed 65 decibels when digging underneath our school. Again, I want to point out the fact that this was a recommended level. This is what the state recommends to schools around the, around the country. Metro is not legally obligated to stop at the 35 decibel limit. Again, they've determined that they're going to reach as high as 65 decibels. Um, these are just a couple of videos that we saw over the summer when uh, Metro was demolishing the building in the staging area. So imagine being in a classroom, trying to listen to a lecture, taking a test, even an SAT or an AP test, and not be, being able to concentrate because of high levels of noise or vibration going on right around you. But keep in mind, all of this will be happening just 15 feet away from these classrooms. And the last concern we'd like to bring up is construction. So I'm going to re revisit this map, and as many of you know, this past June we passed a bond called Measure BH, and that allocated around $350 million over a period of time in order to improve, in order to do construction on our campus at the 4K campuses and to improve technology on our campuses. Now something that happens if Metro goes under our high school, we lose some sovereignty over the land. So anywhere around this route, Whatever, whatever is directly above it or right next to it, we have to talk with Metro and decide, with, and they have to tell us what is okay to be built around them. We were planning on having a new athletic facility right over there where the new tennis courts in that are. That plan has to be changed. We were planning on having a new parking lot around three stories that would go underground as well. But now again, we cannot do that because of the new subway tunnel if it goes under our campus. So, I we gave you some background info, told you some of our concerns. Um, now, really quick, I'd like to bring up our superintendent, Dr. Breggy, for a quick word. Thank you, and thank you for being here tonight. In the very seats that you're in, over 1,200 students at Beverly Hills High School had an opportunity to listen to this presentation and to also ask some questions. The difference is, we didn't have our experts present then, but we have them tonight. So uh, you are in store for some uh, information just shortly. As a superintendent, when I first came into the school district, the Board of Education had been working very hard in litigation in court. In my first couple of months in the district, I spent um, weeks upon weeks going through all of the information. Um, it was necessary. Um, there was a lot of work that was happening internally. I received 
um, an invitation for an appointment from Ryan and from Sean, and they said, look, we want to do more. And my comment to them was, guys, we, we got this, thank you, we have this. But the problem is, where the portables are, they can see it, they can hear it, and they can smell it, what's happening in that staging area. And so they said, this is our high school, and we can't allow this to happen. So as a former teacher, a high school principal for a decade, and now superintendent, I said, what can I do to support you? Some of you even saw me was hanging things up in the hallway for them, like with tape. So anything I can do to support them so that they can get the word out. The high school students, I wish you could be been in here and, and just feel the, the, the passion and the drive that our students have. Um, that the most important message that I want you to take away is something that I do every day in my job. And that is I have to ask myself, does this make sense? Is this reasonable? And if you go back to the slide where it had the original route and the new route, I can tell you there are multiple options available. There is a compromise here where the route doesn't have to go through the heart of our one and only high school in Beverly Hills. And the students want to make it very clear that that compromise must be reached. So, a couple conclusions we'd like to draw before we get into some Q&A. First of all, as you can see, the main problem of why we're here today is there's a lot of uncertainty. Who knows what could happen? That risk factor is so huge, that's why Ryan and I are up here today. That's why we are so worried. It doesn't matter that we're seniors and that we'll be gone in a year. We care for our community and the high school that we're leaving. So we find it essential to make sure that everyone, no matter what you think, is informed and aware of what's going on. Uh, a common argument, really quick, a common argument that people might say is about the oil wells and that they've been here all along. And why is it such a big deal now? Our, our campus, if you look at some maps that Metro leases online, there are methane zones around where the route is going all along Beverly Hills and West LA. But our campus is a special case. The oil wells that are located here are not located anywhere else. The uncertainty of going under a campus where students are learning every single day, there's uncertainty of what could happen there. When you put these risks in front of students, in front of a high school student, in front of a high school, where kids are going to be for four years before they go into college, when you put them in front of all these factors, especially given the fact that they're younger and they could be more susceptible to all of these factors, that's why we're worried. And so moving forward, the students have decided a couple things. First things first, we actually created a new committee that is a part of the student government and reaching out to student leaders outside of, outside of other um, student groups as well. And we're called the Student Action Committee. And what we're doing as a group is putting on these things for you today. Many of you received the newsletter, that's what we put on. And we, we spoke, again, to all the teachers, we spoke to all the students, and now we're speaking to all of you. So the first stage, we hope, again, to make sure everyone in our community is informed and aware, because that is our number one priority. And then moving on from there, again, why does Metro have to go under our high school? When there are alternate routes, why do they have to go this direction? So what we will look forward to is seeing what we can do to see if that route, route can be moved to that original station or to that original route or a different detour route. No matter what happens in the end though, the reason why Ryan and I are up here today is for the health and safety of our students and staff. No matter what happens, that will be our number one goal. That is what we want to achieve. And no matter how we get there, no matter what it is we achieve, we want to make sure that that is the one thing that we do achieve for our students here. Ryan, do you have a couple words? Okay, we students are not naive. We, we understand that Metro is a multi-billion dollar company. We're just a group of 1,200 kids. What can a group of 1,200 kids do against a multi-billion dollar corporation? It's gonna be tough. We understand that. It is going to be tough. 
However, the only way we can achieve something is if every single person in this community stands behind us. Not stand behind Sean and I, but stand behind every single student at this school. We understand that in order to get something done, we have to do more things, more than just community forums, more than just speak to students. We have to go big. We gotta create some kind of commotion. We got to get people in the federal government, whether you agree with their politics or not, to take note of what's happening in Beverly Hills. We have a wide variety of strategies, such as a walkout. We are planning on doing a walkout where all five schools in this district walk to a significant site. Walk to a significant site so news sources like CNN and Fox take note of what's happening in this community. That's how we're going to get something done. The federal government does have the power to stop this. Our goal is to stop the funding to Metro. Yep. Now, you might have a stake in this school, you might not. Your students might attend Beverly, they might not. Every single person in this room or not has an obligation, has an obligation as a human being to get in front of any issue that causes a potential health risk to students, to staff, or to any community member. So that's why we're talking to you here today. We understand the audience is not filled up. We're okay with that. With you parents, we are putting our trust in you. Putting our trust in you so you reach out to whoever you have to reach out to. It's up to you guys. We need your help. We really cannot do it without you. So now, we're going to open it up to questions. So please ask away. Before we do that though, I'm going to actually introduce the experts that we have today. And so, when I say your name, if you could stand up, that would be awesome. So, for first, Dr. Abel. Professor Abel will serve as, authority, as an authority resource on the health effects of airborne pollutants, as well as on the measurement, monitoring, and characteriz characterization of them. Dr. Abel is a professor of clinical preventive medicine and chief of the Environmental Health Division at USC. His expertise is in exposure and health assessment with particular emphasis on the respiratory and cardiovascular effects of airborne pollutants such as PM2.5 and PM10. His research has focused on at-risk populations such as children, young adults, asthmatics, and competitive athletes. Professor Eval also currently serves as the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences supported by Southern California Environmental Health Science Center as well as the director of the Spatial Exposure and Analytics Corps within the center. So thank you for coming. The next expert we have is Dr. Basner. Dr. Basner will serve as a medical and scientific authority on the effects of noise and on children's cognitive performance. Dr. Basner is an associate professor of psychiatry, sleep, and chronobiology division at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2014, he published a study regarding noise and its, and its negative consequences on the cognitive, cognitive performance in school children, a study relied on by the district's Kathleen Moore's consultant. Dr. Basner's primary research interest, interests concern the effects of sleep loss on neurobehavioral and cognitive functions population studies on sleep, time, and waking activities, and the effects of tra traffic noise on sleep and health. Dr. Basner has conducted several large-scale laboratory and the field studies on the effects of noise. He's currently the president of the International Commission on Biological Effects of Noise. So thank you for coming. And the third expert we have is Dr. Schenker. Dr. Schenker will serve as an authority on medical effects of increased airborne pollution and dust on the student population. Dr. Schenker is a board certific certified pulmonologist and a distinguished professor emeritus of public health sciences and medicine at UC Davis. His work has included diverse causes of occupational and environmental illness and injury with a focus on respiratory effects of air pollution and other toxins, including diesel exhaust, asbestos, and agricultural dust. Dr. Schenker has called the attention of occupational health researchers, researchers and epidemiologists to the global health disparities affecting Im immigrants, with particular attention to the occupational health outcomes among immigrant workers. 
has edited six textbooks, including occupational and environmental respiratory diseases. So thank you for coming. <laughs> Too much for even me to, pr to pronounce. <laughs> Tongue twisters. And lastly, Terry Tao. He's a district attorney for our school district here. Ask away. You guys have any questions for us? Go ahead. This might be a naive question, but I just wanted to be honest. Can you give her a microphone? Can you give her the microphone? Can you pass this down? Can you give her the microphone? 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 Probably. The, the way the uh, permitting works uh, with regard to these types of projects, uh, what typically occurs is Metro will do an environmental impact statement and um, try to evaluate all of the environmental uh, effects. However, they have uh, the ability to um, place a line here and they have authority that um, is not uh, under uh, a um, jurisdictional. So like for example, the way you normally see it is they would get approvals from a city for a building permit. Uh, the uh, way the state laws work is when you're doing transportation, you have special authority uh, that is on equal level as a city. So, um, as you may or may not be aware, there was quite a dispute between uh, the city and a, eventually a lawsuit uh, where the city actually um, complained that they should have some jurisdiction over Metro. And ultimately, what they were able to negotiate out, even though Metro did not have to answer to the city, uh, was uh, a memorandum of agreement, or what's typically called an MOA. That MOA was just recently approved by the city, uh, and there are some controls within the MOA, but it's primarily within the city of Beverly Hills. Uh, it's primarily consistent with what's in the uh, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, uh, and uh, the city does not have the ability to control exactly what it is that's being built. So this is one of those few situations where um, the destiny of the um, people who are on the line of the um, subway route, including the school district, uh, we have to act on, on our own. That's one of the reasons why the school district uh, had to bring in outside counsel in order to bring the lawsuit against Metro and against the Federal Transportation Administration to address the funding because of the fact that um, there are special rights given to transportation corridors, if that makes sense. So there's no oversight body? There's no Can you speak up, please? So there is no other oversight body? The state can't do anything, so we can't write to our Congress people or anybody else that can put some pressure other than just the lawsuit? I mean, uh, it can come from various directions. I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear. So the question is, uh, is there um, other um, jurisdictions that have oversight? Is there, there a federal authority or is there a state authority? Yes, um, there is uh, definitely a federal authority. Um, the state is not as clear. Um, so this district has uh, tirelessly gone to their congressmen, their senators, their state state assembly people, and um, have lobbied just about every one that they could, hired lobbyists uh, in order to address um, the situation, including actively going to the County Board of Supervisors and the Metro Board. Uh, so the district has done as much as they possibly can and continue to do so. Uh, however, um, the ultimate authority does rest with the federal government. So that would be the Federal Department of Transportation and um, also <coughs> President Trump. So they do have the ability and authority to do something about it. 
Um, we uh, are actively lobbying them, but understand that they are the federal government. So uh, this is uh, um, this is something that uh, you would need something or some reason for them to pay attention. And if I can just interrupt, uh, so yes, but we shall we'll send you that information because we've been doing that, but now you need to do that. And we'll send you that information so that everybody can continue to do that. I want to. I want to just piggyback ahead, on that. About a year and a half ago. Wait, the it's okay. I mean, about a year and a half ago, I collected on behalf of the district. At, I went to about a lot of town halls, and I've got letters that went to Boxer and to Pelosi and to Feinstein and stuff like that, and they went. So they are very aware of what's going on. We can maybe refax them if it's the time to do that. You know, we the big thing is for any elected official, if they get bombarded, they take they take it serious because they understand that the community is interested. So when you get this on any issues, we're talking today the Metro, but even with city council or any elected official, if there's an issue, don't think that your voice doesn't count. It does. Everybody's running, so everybody's voice does make a difference. So please take these kids and take this issue serious and take everything. And on November 6th, that vote makes a difference. So, take one. A quick comment I'd like to make on that actually is signatures and petitions are always amazing yeah. because they do get that awareness. Yeah. But the power of that versus the power of a community event, like a walkout, that's what we're trying to achieve. Because there's a big difference between having them aware. That's what we have to keep building up. We have this momentum. I've we have worked, both at the same time. I've worked in the elected offices when our fax machines got bombarded and the elected then gets upset because what's going on? And we say that we've gotten 350 form letters on whatever issue. It does make a difference. I mean, those hand in hand is really important. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to jump on what somebody said. We, we, students, yeah, there, there, there are, there are resources where you can learn more about the issue. There's a purple thread. Again, I want to make clear that students and district personnel, <coughs> although we have the same end goal, students are working as students. We are working in order for community members and parents to stand behind us, not the other way around. So. That's, that's how we're going to mobilize everybody. That's how people are going to take note of what's happening with the walkout. Sean and I have been meeting with district personnel week after week. And I kid you not, it will happen. Just, just bear with us, we do not have an exact date. But the parts have been put in place, now we're just trying to fix the little nitty gritty. So you had a question next. Thank you. I'd like to just say, first of all, as a parent of a middle school student at Beverly Vista, I'd like to thank you, too, for the wonderful job you're doing. We really appreciate it. Uh, secondly, I, I wonder if there are any commercial interests that are working against our interests in uh, changing the subway route that you're aware of. And, and third, probably most importantly, we have three experts here on environmental impact. I think it would be impactful on all of us if they could somewhat quantify the effects that can be expected from a project like this over many years and how it would affect our students? Um, we First of all, about the experts, we encourage you to ask the experts all the questions you would like. That's what they're here for. Um, as in, the, the health effects, the major health effects John and I touched on. The diesel, the hydrogen sulfide, the methane. Now, if you want to get into more specifics, I encourage you to ask a question about that. We have three experts flying in from all over the country. As, a, as for the commercial, does anyone want to answer that? Um, Mr. Tal? I'll try to answer. <laughs> Obviously, there would be a great interest in having the subway go through Century City. Um, we uh, would speculate that there are some uh, definite commercial interests to uh, having the line move towards Century City financially. It would be beneficial, obviously, to anybody in Century City. Um, so uh, that that's about the best that I could do as far as answers are, are concerned with regard to commercial interest. Uh, it's probably pretty obvious that it would be more, more commercially viable to take a line through Century City. 
We can also look at the Century City Chamber of Commerce's key supporters because they were the biggest advocate at all the metro meetings behind the city people that went. So you can look at those people and probably lobby them as well. If I could just say to all of you, your most important thing is to lobby the federal government. The die has been cast. The locals have made their decision. Locals meaning the Metro Board and the supervisors. Your job is to go to thepurplethreat.com and look at the phone numbers, look at the email addresses of Secretary Chow, the White House, and all the others, Ted Lieu. If Ted Lieu had spoken up and said, I don't want this, it would have stopped. Before that, Waxman. So please understand, at this point, you need advocacy, you need to flex your muscle. If you know large donors, to either the Democrats or the Republicans, have them reach out and demand that this is a priority and that it be rerouted. That is absolutely what has to be done. Going back about commercial interests, it was all a lie and all a fabrication. It doesn't matter anymore. We're here now. Now it's about stopping the funding to have them rerouted. Um, I, think, I think right now we're going to give an opportunity to experts to speak and then we can open up to questions again. So, uh, where would you like to start? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so again, my name is Matthias Bastian and I'm a noise expert. Um, and obviously the uh, major concern with the uh, construction noise that would be going on is how that interferes with classroom activities. So there have been a number of studies investigating this issue. And of course, the problem is there's communication going on in the classroom. Uh, the teacher uh, is teaching something to the student and if there is a certain background noise level and that may be a constant noise level but it may also be intermittent due to a truck driving by or due to some uh, intermittent construction noise that of course that can interfere with the communication. It can be that the teacher has to raise his or her voice uh, that can be exhausting. It can even be that the teacher has to stop teaching for a while because of the noise and it can be that what, whatever is being communicated does not, is not received correctly at the end of the student. So the student misunderstands something and that can then you know, translate you know, throughout the whole class lesson. So uh, studies that have looked into this have found that uh, several cognitive domains can be affected uh, for example, uh, reading, uh, reading comprehension, uh, memory, uh, but also problem solving. These are things that have been found to be implicated by noise uh, in the classroom. And uh, typically what these studies find, uh, and so they show that you know, with every 10 decibel increase in the noise that typically uh, these students would be one to two months behind their peers that are not exposed to noise. Um, and um, these studies also found that the decrease is, is linear with the noise. So um, the, the higher the noise, of course, the, the, the lower the, uh, the academic performance will be of the students. One very prominent study in, uh, in Europe found that once the noise levels were 55 decibels or higher on the outside, that then the uh, test scores would uh, drop uh, beyond average. Uh, so th this is the major concern of the noise. There have been other studies though that also uh, show different potential concerns. Uh, one very prominent study around Munich Airport, actually they, uh, this is you know some 20 years ago, uh, they opened a new airport in Munich and they actually used this as a kind of natural experiment. And they looked at the uh, children that were exposed at the old airport, uh, uh, how their academic performance 
was and how their blood pressure was uh, before that airport closed and after it closed. And they also looked at the students at the new airport before it opened and after it opened. And they could see that uh, academic performance kind of recovered in those students that were no longer exposed. Also, that blood pressure dropped significantly. And exactly the other thing was happening in the students that were newly exposed which is a good indicator that there may be a causal relationship between the noise and what we see uh, in the student's academic performance. Now, I want to mention that what was mentioned earlier. First of all, I mean, our auditory system is pretty incredible. We can hear the tiniest little quiet thing, and then we can stand next to an aircraft jet, and, you know, that still works. Our auditory system works in an incredible range. Uh, this is why they came up with this strange decibel metric. It's a logarithmic scale. And actually, was it what it means? So one decibel increase in sound pressure level is typically something that we can just detect, something that we can just uh, realize that there is a difference. Uh, if the sound pressure level increases by three decibels, it means that the sound energy uh, doubled. You know, for example, if you let's say you have an eight-hour period and there's a hundred trucks. If you have 200 trucks, that means that the sound pressure level will, be, will increase by 3 decibels. And typically, if the sound pressure level decreases by 10 decibels, that is something that we humans perceive it as twice as loud. So, um, I believe MTA has made measurements, uh, like pre-construction measurements at this school, and they measured an uh, average noise level of 56 uh, decibels. Um, again, there is uh, some regulation or some recommendations uh, relative to the outdoor noise level, uh, especially in European countries, and they typically uh, place that recommended volume between 50 and 60 decibels. That is, it shouldn't be louder than 50, 55, 60 decibels outside. So what was measured here was 56 decibels. Of course, the question is, this is a one-time I believe it was a 24-hour measurement. The question is how representative is that, or it is something. And I think the projection is that because of the construction, the noise levels will uh, uh, rise to 62 decibels, if not higher, at uh, 67. Uh, 67 decibels, which would be um, uh, more than twice as loud. And obviously, relative to these, these existing regulations and, and, and recommendations, guidelines, uh, those would be exceeded. There are other guidelines. There's an ANSI standard and the World Health Organization has also the so-called community uh, noise guidelines. They typically recommend that noise levels inside the classroom, background noise levels, should not exceed 30, uh, 35 decibels. Now typically, when, when you have like an outside noise level of 56, it's not going to be 56 in the classroom. There's going to be uh, a noise attenuation, so the building structure is filtering out some of that noise, especially the high frequencies though. Uh, so typically for a, for a good building structure, you would assume at like 25 decibel lower noise level. So when we, when we are talking 62 decibels, or 67 on the outside, we wouldn't expect that in the classroom. We, we would expect the higher levels than the 35 that are uh, typically recommended. Um, I think that's a good start, I hope, and I would... Uh, Just a couple of things. I mean, yes. Let me <clears throat> steal this one from you. Um, Dr. Basner is uh, actually the author of the study that cited to behind his head. He didn't see it because I put it up while he was talking. Um, that is the study that's used by the California Department of Education and the recommended ANSI standards. Um, we don't necessarily agree or believe that uh, the um, ambient noise around the um, uh, classrooms is as high as what it is that was represented in the Metro SEIS. We actually believe it's significantly lower than the 50 uh, to 55 that uh, Metro actually published in their SCIS. Um, the, there is a Caltrans standard that is used, so just to kind of give you context, if you use 35 as your standard, uh, Caltrans allows you to go up to 10 decibels more. Similarly, the city of Beverly Hills uses 
10 decibels as their measuring stick, which is actually in the MOA. So if uh, the ambient noise is, say, 45 decibels, then uh, both, and, uh, both Caltrans and the city allows you to then go to 55 decibels. To give you context, when we watch the video of the shaking of the water, that video was approximately 70 decibels inside the classrooms during the demolition. So uh, it is significantly more than what it is that the recommended standard is, even if you go the 10 dBs more, which would take you to 45 decibels, uh, that um, is uh, uh, quite a bit more. In the SEIS, what uh, Metro is saying is that they're going to be at 67 decibels for much of the time in the exterior of the building. Yeah. Just one thing to mention there too is that uh, what 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 is in these documents? These are average noise level. But basically, they're looking at a certain time period, which is you know, for example, when there is class in session here, and then they're averaging across all the time. So there may very well be periods where you have much higher noise levels. Uh, and they may uh, interfere much more with uh, what, ha what is happening in the, in the classroom, but that's not necessarily reflected in the average value. And there's actually a, a lot of debate right now in the research community, uh, basically questioning whether this equivalent average noise level, whether this is really a good descriptor for the noise exposure, whether, whether that is really what matters for the outcome and for 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 uh, the teaching that is going in the classroom, there was a very recent study that was related to aircraft noise exposure that actually found that you know the number of noise events above a certain noise level, in this case 70 decibel, or the cumulative time spent above that certain noise level, that, that was a much better predictor of academic performance than just an equivalent and average across all that time. I do exposure research. I'm interested in how people get exposed and what the health impacts of those exposures are, particularly in children. And so let me give you a couple of simple perspectives and I'll try to be short about it. Uh, first, it's all about trade-offs. It's all about relative risk. Everything you do involves some amount of risk. Crossing the street, making your choice for food that you eat, turning on the lights, driving your car, it's all about risk. Here, in this case, there are trade-offs, there are options, there are choices you can make here that reduce or increase your risk. None of this is zero. Life isn't about zero risk. And so what we want to try to do is control or reduce the risks that we can. There are other options for Metro to take here. They can go a different way. And there are lots of good reasons why they should. The research that I do is about air pollution, about how that affects children's growth and development the respiratory, the cardiovascular, the neurological <coughs> systems. And we know that putting children next to a bunch of diesel trucks, a bunch of construction equipment for several years, that those particulate levels, those gas emissions, are going to raise their exposure. It's going to increase what they breathe, and that will have some effects. Now we can argue about how big or little those effects will be, but those effects will be measurable over the course of time. And by putting this in a different location, we can reduce those risks. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider, excuse me, the other thing to consider is we're talking about some potentially dangerous gases in the field space below the school. Methane is a truly flammable explosive gas. In the last week, you may have read about the explosions in Boston, a number of homes, that was methane gas, essentially natural gas through those systems overpressurized. A couple of years ago, you may remember Porter Ranch, Aliso Canyon, that was methane gas, storage in the wells where a well blew out. I'm not saying that this is absolutely going to happen, I'm saying there's an increased risk. We don't know exactly what the levels are below or where exactly they are or if they will come out in the, in the process. 
Yes. Seems pretty likely that in drilling underneath the school, it's going to come out somewhere. And so the question is, how much and where? And as was shown in the slide presentation by the students, the Ross store explosion 40 years ago shows that this can happen right in the general vicinity. So I think it's, it's reasonable to be concerned about this. I think on the issue of air pollution, it's reasonable to be concerned about these things. And again, we can argue we're not just talking about increased cancer and whether it's three or ten times we can play a numbers game and talk about it. There are also other respiratory, cardiovascular, all sorts of effects we might talk about. The issue is one of risk and concern and again, options and trade-offs. I work a lot with communities. I've been involved for many years with issues down in San Pedro and Bloomington in the ports of Los Angeles, trying to mitigate, minimize, and offset some of the impacts of the cargo movement industry in those communities, as well as along the 710 freeway, trying to deal with the issue of Caltrans wanting to expand the freeway through the communities from the ports to downtown Los Angeles. So don't be discouraged if you think that Metro is a multi-billion dollar organization that you have no voice against. So is Caltrans, and we managed to stop them for several years. Well, again, the, the different colors suggest some different increase in concentrations with distance from the source. And the point is that the school, the property, is right on the edge of where the, the excavation and the tunneling is going to take place. So that basically what Metro is proposing right now is to create a truck transit center right on the edge of the school property and have up to 300 trucks moving in and out of that area every day for the next several years. And so that's going to increase emissions there, it's going to raise the levels of particulate. There have been something like 25 or 35,000 scientific publications published thus far about the health effects of particulates. I don't think I need to go through all of them at one time. Um, but there are measurable effects. There will be some slight increases. Now, it is true that Los Angeles is a polluted place from time to time. We do have days. I grew up here in Los Angeles. It's much cleaner than it was when I was a child here, but it still is in violation of the federal standards and the state standards for particulate and ozone. And particulate is going to be an issue here. Okay, well, um, it's great to come back to my hometown. Uh, and I spent today walking around the campus and visiting the laydown site. And I have to say, the most impressive uh, impression was the absurdity of putting this right an arm's length from all these classrooms. I mean, who in the right mind would think to put this right next to the classrooms where you have kids trying to learn? Uh, you've heard about all the exposures, and those are real, and I could talk at length about the hazards that exist. Um, but on its face, you know, we don't do that. You know, th this makes no sense, and the point has been made, there are alternatives. So, you know, somebody needs to get their numbers right and move this to a safer site that isn't impacting kids. So let me just make a couple basic uh, points. Uh, one is the principle of prevention. Um, the idea is in preventive medicine that you prevent disease, you reduce or eliminate exposures, not you put them in and try and deal with the health effects that occur from them. And nobody wants to be dealing with the increased asthma exacerbations or the decreased learning performance or the stress or any of the other health effects that are projected. The second is, uh, I agree, it's not a matter of quantifying the risk. The point is that it's preventable risk. So we're talking about additional cases of the various diseases you've heard that don't need to occur. And I think that's the way to look at this, not to say, well, it's bigger than this risk or this is the actual number. Uh, these are avoidable, and that should be the working principle. Third point I want to make is that 
young people are more vulnerable in general to air pollutants and adverse health effects than uh, grown-ups are. I mean, the bodies are growing. The, for example, respiratory uh, impact is greater per body size for a young person than for an adult. Um, and, you know, we need to be protecting young people, not exposing them to risks and dealing with the consequences. The next point that strikes me, uh, I've done work on diesel exhaust, and diesel is a dirty fuel. Um, it's one that is being reduced. Uh, some car companies are eliminating diesel vehicles. Uh, the ports have moved to electric to reduce diesel ex emission. There are alternatives, and to see this moving backwards and having 300 diesel trucks coming in every day is moving in the wrong direction. We've got to be forward-looking. We can't be looking backwards with old technologies, particularly ones that are putting uh, children at risk. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very striking to me coming in and looking at the situation, and obviously there are the politics of how it's come about, but I completely agree. You know, it's beautiful to see everybody here, to see the efforts that have been made, and to support the effort to come up with a, an alternative that makes sense. Not an alternative to stop the purple line, but one that puts it in a safer place, particularly as it affects the children. Alright, so we could open up to some more questions. Right here. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I see that, you know, you guys been uh, you're going through this uh, changing the route for many years and and uh, still Metro is proceeding with their plan. What's the plan B in case you cannot change it? What are you going to do with the high school students? Are you going to move them to another school? Is there another school be being built all these years? What, what's the plan B? So we're working on plan B, but it's not the best plan. You know, we're pretty landlocked. One high school in one city. And you know we're challenged by our own construction that's happening, as well as the oil well decommissioning. And so we are looking at where can we move some students that are in the that first line of portable classrooms. And so but we're really challenged with space at the high school as the construction continues to modernize our high school. Um, we're, it's like a chess game. Where do we put our students? And so while we're looking for those alternative places, just as we start doing that, we have the where we are today, sitting here right now, our largest space for students. Next year, starting in August, we're, move, we're having to move out students and staff from this location because of construction. So it's, it's, it's a very big challenge for us, but we're looking at utilizing all of our classroom space as, as much as possible. But that's why we're addressing you now, because it's not too late. It is not too late to compromise. So while we are working on a plan B, it's not the best plan. And as your superintendent, even if it's a 1% chance that safety is being impacted, even 1% greater, that's still too big of a percent for me. And we're going to keep doing everything we can. Excuse me, Mr. can we disperse the students to... It's based on what he was saying. Let, me, let the lawyer respond. I'll get you right out. Uh, I apologize. I, I'm going to just point out a couple of things. Um, while we would hope and we would really prefer that Metro move to a different location or um, at least move their uh, lay down area so that it's not uh, as a, causing such a great effect on the uh, classrooms and the student learning environment, we do do some planning around here. We try to do some planning around here. So there were a couple of things that we have been able to do, which is um, with the MOA, which I will throw up there, uh, there were some clauses that were negotiated.
paid out uh, to address measurement and independent monitoring for some of the uh, chemicals, uh, including noise standards, uh, chemical measuring standards, the ability to shut down the project if certain standards were exceeded. The second thing we are actively working with uh, Metro on in case we uh, actually have to live with uh, the route next door is this is their lay down area. So we focused on a couple of areas. The second bubble that we put up is a air scrubber, so that'll be a noise generator. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to lessen the amount of noise from the air scrubber and also lessen the impact associated with the air scrubber. Um, the next location, the third bubble, is actually the location of uh, the um, slurry plant, and that's also a very loud um, plant, so we're trying to get that moved or at least change the hours of working. Uh, the biggest problem is actually the turnaround area, uh, and um, you've heard a little bit about the problems with NOx, NO2, uh, basically the diesel particulates, PM 2.5. Uh, so I asked Dr. Schenker um, how we should deal with the um, actual effects associated with the uh, turnaround. So I'll um, let Dr. Schenker talk a little bit about um, different ways that the turnarounds um, and the diesel exhaust are typically addressed. Well, uh, I'm a physician health effects guy, uh, and the way it's addressed in my mind is you reduce the exposure. Uh, and exposure is either by controlling the source or moving the distance. Uh, and to me, the most shocking thing is this lay down area is right next to the school upwind from it. It's almost, you know, bizarre that you know, they've placed this in the perfectly wrong situation for exposing the students who are in the classrooms. And so any solutions that put that at a distance and control the exposure in terms of generation of diesel are going to be acceptable. And how you do that, whether it's nighttime work or electrification or other solutions are for the engineers. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, my question is addressed to Superintendent Reggie. Can we can we use our middle school and elementary school campuses as a plan B? El Rodeo, schools, and take our students here to those campuses we've, we've looked at that, and there would be no way to move in, in a comprehensive high school to four different campuses so we've looked at doing that but it's just it just isn't possible to to move everybody we've looked at the numbers sorry um what are some of the other routes that you guys are considering what like what's the safe route that you guys are talking about Santa Monica. So uh, the first route that we, so I want, I, want, I want you guys to understand, our first goal is to get Metro to the table. Our first goal is to get Metro to the table to negotiate. The yeah. first route would be go back on Santa Monica, Santa Monica Boulevard. They claim that there are fault lines there, but we, we have found, in fact, no, no fault lines under Santa Monica. The second route would be under the football field, though. Going under the football field, if we have an image. But going under the football field would prevent the route from going under the portables from going under the classrooms. But then if it goes under the football field, it's still there. You're going to put it under the field, you're going to open up a whole new can of worms. You just got rid of the oil well. What do you think? Not the going to get back to us. You raise the hand and do this efficiently. Sorry. So under the football field, isn't that still, you know, hazardous to kids? Aren't they still... That's, yeah. aren't, aren't Again, kids? It is, you're right. Going under the football field is still going to be hazardous to kids. Going under the route that it's, we're, we're currently arguing about 
is going to be hazardous to kids. That's the point we're trying to get across. The so, point sorry, that we're my question was, where are the safe routes that you guys were discussing? Under the Santa current Monica. street, Santa Monica Boulevard. If you don't, if you don't count in fault lines into the argument, the Santa Monica station and that route would be the safest one. Okay. When it was presented to the city and we all voted on R, it was proposed under Santa, to go down Monica. Santa Monica. The original route was to go down Santa Monica. They decided to detour the under the high school, the bungalows. They decided to detour under the high school and put a staging area right next to us in order to reach the, the large amount of buildings under constellation or over constellation. No. No. Sorry, right? All right, go ahead. <laughs> so, I think she was there. Right now, Go ahead, sir. No, it's going to, it, they moved it to go to Constellation because there's a vacant lot there that's owned by a Chicago real estate company called JMB, and they are going, they wanted their, in order to build their, their building there, they needed what is called trip credits, which means they needed a subway station there. And, and they donated lots of money to the Metro Board, to people in the Metro Board, and, they, uh, and, and, that's, and they, they had a backroom deal in 2010 where they made that decision to move it there. They came up with the seismic excuse, which is totally fallacious and has been proved on, say, uh, wrong, and then they, and they will not do a ridership study because, because it will not show that the, that, that station there in the middle of, Santa, of um, on Constellation will be better than Santa Monica simply because the you have traffic coming in from both Westwood and, and Beverly Hills on on Santa Monica where Constellation is a dead end on both ends. The, the station on Constellation is buried deep into the ground. Who wants to go into a subway station there? The route is, is slower and longer. Who wants to ride a, a... So they have not done a comparison. I'm going to send, send this over here. One second. So let, let me just try to explain <laughs> this to you, just to the oh, public. Yeah. The methane gas under the field. The thing about methane gas that's dangerous is when it gets trapped in an enclosed space like a basement or a building. It goes out into the atmosphere when it's out under the field. But the problem with putting the rails under the field is you lose your sovereignty here. You lose your sovereignty in your land use over the entire campus. You will have to ask Metro permission to build an outhouse. So that is a serious consideration. Putting it down the heart of the campus, shallow tunnels, two oxygenated electrified tubes running all day, every day, 18 hours a day, is an absolute uh, danger to this community. From explosions, from methane gas, hydrogen sulfides, you know, even terror. So th there's competing reasons why we don't want it. The least harm would be under the ball field, but you would lose your sovereignty which ultimately means you have no land use. And ultimately, if you back all this in, if you can't use a high school, why would you use the school district at all? Why would you move in? I mean, this really is an existential threat to this community, and I hope all of you realize that. That's why a board, every iteration of board has been fighting this, because it really is an existential threat. We will lose our sovereignty, our safety, our sanctity, our way of life, and the city will be hurt immeasurably, incalculably, forever. So it's up to all of you to do what you can to advocate for all this in the right way, in the positive way. Additionally, JMB wanted that under their parcel because they wanted to boost density. They were legally entitled to 12 stories residential. 2008, the market fell out. They wanted commercial, and they got up to 38 stories without doing any traffic mitigation, purchasing no trip credits, and they're getting a 38-story building because they gave money to 15 council members, of five of them who sit on the Metro board. So this was all pay-to-play, backroom deals. This was all crony capitalism, corporate welfare, name of what it was. And here we are now. We can't go back in time. 
the subway stop isn't even going under GMB anymore, which is still a vacant lot. They're not getting the transit plaza there. It's been moved. They don't even care. It's time to lobby the federal government, the DOT, Secretary Chow, and Donald Trump, and Ted Lieu. Okay. Um, let's, let's open it up to questions now. I, I, I want to say, one thing about our presentation, Sean and I kept this as transparent as possible. We, we believe, students believe, that in order to win this fight, we have to be transparent. This cannot be a one-sided thing. We present both sides and we let community members make the decision on who they would like to support. So again, I, I, I don't know the politics behind it. I'm not here to know the politics behind it. I am here to tell you guys the facts. The facts that Metro has stated and the facts that the district has stated. That's what we're here to do. We're here to learn the facts. And based on the facts, make a decision. Okay? Okay, so just a couple more questions. Just we're going to call in a student. She has a question okay. she's been dying to ask. You have to speak up. Okay, okay. I just want to start off by acknowledging the environment in here has been getting a little hostile, and I just want to acknowledge the work that the two have been doing tirelessly. This is such an important issue. As a student, I still have another two years in the school. I have a little brother who's coming here. I don't want to have to be worried about getting cancer while I'm at school, trying to learn and you know, prepare for my future. At the last board meeting, Dr. Breggy, I think, brought up the fact that there is a incomplete health report that has been turned in by Metro that has been due for a while. And I'm just curious, how are they gonna be able to finish construction, or even start, for that matter, with an incomplete report? And how will that be able to, you know, benefit our argument that they're not even giving us all this information, you know? So you have the information on the air quality um, <laughs> cancer risk. This, okay, so so that you're aware, I did not put the actual uh, a metro uh, uh, document up there, but the middle category cancer risk significance threshold that says one in one million the way that metro did it is they use the SCAQMD threshold so that third column is the one that metro says that your cancer risk is based on the uh, lay down area next door that's the uh, construction that will be going on for the next seven years. The recalculated one that um, our experts did is actually the second column, um, which addresses the uh, anticipated uh, cancer risk associated with PM2.5, PM10, and uh, NOx and NO2. Um, the significance of what it is that our experts is saying is um, that the increased cancer risk primarily from the construction laydown area is something that actually Metro is capable of addressing by moving all of their equipment to what's called level four equipment, best available technology. Uh, and it's not foreign, it's not something that cannot be done. So the risks for cancer associated with the construction laydown area is something that even if they left the construction laydown area where it is, that they actually that Metro can actually do something about. So um, the example that I was given was uh, when the uh, Oakland port was redone. Um, the decision was made to move the Oakland um, trucks to level four trucks. And that means no, essentially no emission trucks. So that would mean that the trucks would be essentially all electric. So if the 300 truck trips that occur every day during the next seven years became all electric trucks, then the NOx, the NO2, the PM2.5, 
would all but be eliminated. So it is possible to mitigate the cancer risk, uh, but what Metro has done, the position that they've taken, is that they only need to mitigate up to the level that is regulated. Uh, so they use the SCAQMD regulation threshold, which is uh, 10 in a million as their guidance to work from. So that's, that's what that chart is meant to address. It uh, is a little complicated. There's a little, there is some, um, some uh, uh, debate over it, so I want to be clear. Um, we recalculated it uh, using our experts. Even if you took just Metro's position, which is um, one third of 10 in 1 million is what it is that Metro is saying, uh, that is an increased cancer risk um, that could be mitigated uh, completely with going to a level four truck, if that makes any sense to you. Okay. Uh, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, I work in Century City, and I look down uh, on the staging area, and it's unbelievable how fast it's progressing. And I think a lot of the people in the community probably aren't even aware how fast they're already, like, you know, two-thirds of the way up Century Park East. My question is, um, you've identified alternative routes or the original route. Has anyone identified alternative staging areas for Metro? So there's two parts to this, where the staging area is and where the route is. And even if you move where the staging area is, you could decrease that transfer of the diesel particulate matter to come into our campus. But at the same time, you have that risk of the methane and the hydrogen sulfide under the campus. So yes, like that could, moving the staging area somewhere else can mitigate it. I'm sure they have done studies to see where else they can move along that instead of being 15 feet below further down. But still, they're going through 70 to 80 unmapped oil wells. No, That's a risk in its own. I'm just concerned, like, maybe eventually they agree to another route. They still want to keep the stage. I'm more worried tonight about the staging area than the tunnels. So if, if the route were to stay on Santa Monica, the staging area would not be adjacent to the high school. Where exactly, where exactly that staging area would be, we're not sure. We don't know. The intermediate problem. So, Sure. So the staging area for years and years during the preparation of the original um, federal, the original EIS, was actually down. I think it was uh, a, a constellation. Uh, so it was originally located away from uh, the uh, area adjacent to the school. So it was only within the past year that Metro, in their revised SEIS move their staging area next to the school. So our preference would be that um, Metro move their staging area back to where they originally planned, which is right next to the uh, where the station is, or the planned station is. So that is something that we've been um, asking for. You've been waiting, sir. Here you go. Hi, um, my name is Marvin Winans Jr. and I just first want to say thank you guys for the experts and Dr. Brady and Dr. Um, uh, Terry Tao and the students. Um, I think this is amazing what you're doing and I think it's so important. Um, it, I passionately believe it needs to be stopped so you know I'm for this and I think we need to do everything we can to stop it. Um, just one point of, point of context, even from the sound, I know when people talk about DBs, and if you're not, like I'm, I'm involved in music, that's my background, and so you may not understand the DB conversation when he was talking about it, um, but I was actually, I happened to be there when we took the tour of the, the portable, and I was in the room, and having been in music, you're in studios, and the sound, and I'm, I'm, I love loud music in the studio, you know, it's totally great, and I can take it for hours. Having been in there for five minutes, it was at a decibel level, and I would love to hear an expert opinion on, on why, but it was at a it was at a level to where I, I felt after five minutes I had to get out of here because it was bothering me, you know, in a place like in my ear, I don't know how, but in a way that I needed to leave. And it, that was interesting to me because I didn't think it would, you know, bother me because I'm used to that. 
So I would be interested to know if that's a, like the frequency, you know, if it's at a certain level, the, the, the low level, that it bothers you on that, on that level. So that's just a little bit of context from my standpoint. And I just have a suggestion as well, just like everyone got here because of the email that was sent out. Sometimes I'm a part of, you know, I may be a part of an email list where they'll include, like, uh, you can you send out an email where there's already maybe a link to something that already has the pre-written letter already to the Secretary of Transportation that once it's sent out, we can just, you know, I don't know, just click and then you have hundreds of emails going, you know, immediately. I think that would be a really good thing. So, something I'd like to comment on quickly is we're supposed to end at 8. I'm fine staying a little bit longer answering some questions. I hope that's okay with you guys as well. Before, okay, that's okay. Before I give it to you guys, I'm, a, I'm very happy you brought that up because before you guys leave, I just want to quickly say that outside, we put up this poster board with some post it notes and pens. And that's the chance for you to share any thoughts you have from this presentation, any, any words you have, but more importantly, advice, suggestions, recommendations, people you know, anything of that sort. Because Ryan and I are two people, we can't do this alone. We have a group of students at Beverly, we cannot do it alone. We need all of you guys. So if you have any comments, if you have any suggestions, recommendations, anything of that sort, before you leave, if you could write it on the post-it note and put it on the board, that would be very helpful. Uh, Mr. May I ask your last name, sir? Wynans. Mr. Tubman, I'm sorry. Wynans. Wynans Jr. Wynans. And I'm running for school board. I just want to let you know that students will be sending out constant newsletters. I really, I really appreciate your comment. We will be including links of what you guys can do to get in front of these issues. More information, more uh, opportunities to come out. Thank um, you. I mean, we can take more questions. I, I, you want to? You want to? I'm sorry, yeah, I can uh, briefly answer directly to that comment. Uh, very valid. Uh, actually, noise is defined as unwanted sound. And as such, it has two components. There's a physical component of the sound pressure level, but there's also a psychological component. So context matters a lot. If you say you can listen to loud music eight hours a day, it's no problem. It's because it's not noise to you. It's something that you enjoy, something that you like to do. But if you were in that classroom and it's physically the same sound pressure level, it's like really something you don't want to hear. And in that moment, it becomes noise to you, it becomes annoying, annoying, and it can have negative health consequences. So it's, 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 it's really uh, very much the context that matters. And, uh, and you are right, there are like uh, uh, studies that look into low frequency noise exposure and there can actually be physiological reactions associated with that, like some po po uh, people report uh, heart racing or nausea, something like that. So uh, if you have noise in a certain spectrum, that can, that can uh, elicit some physiological reactions. Typically, all these measurements are in uh, so-called DBA, so the A filter is, is used to, uh, to determine the noise level and the A filter is basically mimicking uh, the human auditory system. So there are frequencies that we hear better, like between one and four kilohertz, for example. This is where speech happens. And then the very low frequencies, the very high frequencies we don't hear so well. So the, they Sorry. won't be reflected as much at the A weighted decibel level. But again, you know, there may be and maybe that the low frequency components may actually have other physiologic reactions. Sorry, you've been waiting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much. And I am with you, I will support you, I will get others to support you and volunteer, that is what I do. Um, I wanted to ask, have you guys gone before the city council? Because what you're doing is making people listen and understand more. I've understood this for a while and it scares me so very much. But the city council, for whatever reasons, I don't know, political, maybe they don't see it the same way. But I feel like you guys need to go, you need to get students, parents will support you and, and, and talk to them. Or if you haven't already, but oh, that's a great idea. you need to go to their meetings, they need to hear you guys. You guys have researched, you guys have done your work, you brought all these people here. and just.
Thank you. Thank you. And we're here for you. Really quick, something I want to mention about what we're doing for the students. I'll look at you in a second. About what you just said, yeah. it all comes down to, we said this at the end of the presentation, in order for this to work and to achieve something, we need buy-in from everyone. Yeah. So that's why we're reaching out to the students, the teachers, and you guys first. After that, then we'll start going to the people on top. That's when we're going to start raising that commotion so they actually see what we have behind us. Do you need some news crews? Again, recommendations outside. Please put them up. Anything. It would be amazing. Go ahead. I'm Simon Kleinert. I've been a resident of Beverly Hills for 15 years. I love children. I really, I have children all over the world. Oh, the mic. Oh, the I can't hear you. My kids graduated and everything. But shame on Metro to consider putting a Metro station under our high school. Now, I have to share something. My grandmother and my mother always said, when you use your spoons, to spill the soup, you don't burn your hands. So I want everybody make the part bipartisan. You, all, you mentioned is Ted Lou, blah, blah, blah. Where is Ted Lou? We all voted for him. Where is he? Where are the others? We got to go to the president. And we're very lucky he's there and he will help if we make, put our hands all together. Yeah. Yes. Here you go. All yours. You guys can both ask a question. Okay, I just want to say as an alumni of Beverly Hills High School, I was affected by the oil well. So parents, these things are real and they're true and they happen. This is not just a story. Um, they can get cancer. I got it at the age of 23 and so many of the classmates and so many of the teachers and so many other people got sick. I couldn't send my older two kids to Beverly High for that same reason. Now I have two younger kids that I won't send if this metro is going to go under. Um, at the PT meeting of Elmerdale, a lot of the other parents said the same thing. My only question is a lot of the other parents that I speak with feel like it's a lost cause, like they, it's not gonna, they can't help. So if you guys really feel like there's a chance, why not like, facilitate it and send petitions home through the schools to each of the families? And then they just sign it and return it, and then put the doorknobs on each of the residents, have them sign it, and we pick it up. Right. Like, I, I appreciate what you two are doing, but you need more hands to make um, this happen. How, just, how can we help you? Yeah. First, I, I want to say sorry that you have to go through that. I, I really feel for you. Um, great point. What are we doing? What are we, what are we standing here to do? First step to inform people. Without people having the information, nothing's going to happen. We can all walk out, we can all do this and that, but without people wanting to stand behind the cause, we're not going to achieve something. We've talked to over 1,200 students. We're talking to parents. We've gone to PTA meetings. We stood in front of 500 teachers before school started and talked to them about what's happening with Metro. We're getting the information out there. What's next? Create commotion. It's more than just speaking to people. It's creating chaos. It's creating enough chaos so people may take note of what's happening here. And I promise you, I promise you, I've missed many tests, missed many homework assignments in order to get in front of this issue, in order to meet with Dr. Berge and Sean. We have been talking about things to do. A walkout is going to happen. This is the first time we've formally announced that. It's going to happen. More community forums. There are about 50 parents here. We need every single parent in this community to know what's happening. We students have a responsibility in order to get people informed. You guys have a responsibility to get people informed. She mentioned go to speak to city council. We are going to take people's comments and do them. We don't lose anything by doing extra. I kid you not. We are going to do everything in our power in order to stop this. It's happened so many times in history. Having large groups of people stand in front of a cause. Large groups of people, not congressmen, not senators, not presidents. It's people. If we all stand together, if we all stand behind this cause, I promise you, I promise you, we will make a change. We will promise that all the help that we have committed to so thank you for your comment. I have a question. Right. I'm the attorney. 
I want to know um, in the court, has it ever been mentioned that maybe God forbid, like in the future if they do this, like someone could do a bombing right under the high school? Because it's been done in, in Metro in London, in Metro in Spain, there was bombings. They could do it under the high school and in one shot everybody could die. Has it ever been mentioned? <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure if I'm actually doing the uh, trial on this matter or the actual litigation. There's an outside law firm. Um, I do believe that there has been some discussion about not only the dangers but also the possibility of terrorism. However, um, we do recognize there's a couple of things about court so that uh, we're all on the same page. Um, one of the things that we can't do is fear monger, right? So what we can do is we can bring up a point and then move on, uh, so, but you can't be dogged on something. So typically what happens with things like terrorism or even like methane, the possibility of explosion, is you get the scientific data out um, and then you address it based on the percentage chance of something occurring, for example. On methane, it's over 5% air saturation. So you get that information out and you talk about it that way and then you move on. Um, and the, the students have done an incredible job of uh, getting the word out. Uh, I'll tell you personally, I go to all of the public forums that Metro puts on and the students of Sean and Ryan have been at those forums and they've gotten Metro to pay attention. So they've uh, asked questions, very thoughtful, very um, uh, nicely worded, very um, modest questions so that uh, Metro uh, pays attention. And they've uh, actually added slides to their presentation and I know that they're paying attention to what it is that uh, Ryan and Sean have been doing and also the um, students uh, when they start to organize, I'm sure that there will be a lot of attention. <laughs> Just a quick aside, there is still a federal lawsuit uh, with Metro, and uh, that federal lawsuit is based on the revised SEIS. Uh, it is not over. Um, I know that there was a newspaper headline a couple of days ago. The ruling from that court hearing actually came out the day after uh, the um, uh, the newspaper headline, and we did get everything that we asked for as far as the um, information for the record. So uh, it is not over, it's not a lost cause. There is still a lawsuit. However, we do recognize that uh, it's very difficult to uh, take on a transportation corridor uh, that is supported essentially by the federal government. So we do recognize the difficulty of it, which is why we also do some planning for um, air quality and other effects. And we would, uh, at a minimum, would want to see a lot done with regard to this construction laydown area, which, at least in my mind, is my uh, single greatest concern. Thank you. And just really quick, because this will get me going. Um, students did invite representatives from Metro. They declined to be here. Really? Okay, thank you. At the community meetings, they have asked, come talk to our school community. That's yet to happen, even with a personal invitation. And I'm going to go back to what you asked for. Do you need news crews? Yes, we do. If you know a celebrity, who are they? Let us know. This Metro is used to people pushing back against Metro. I've asked this question in a year and a half that I've been here. What other public high school have you tunneled underneath? No answer. No other public well, high school have they tunneled underneath. They so we do need your help. We need help of celebrities. We need, but Metro's used to people pushing back. We have to go to the federal government. And that's what we're planning to walk out. We've got lots of plans that we will share with you. But we need news crews. We need helicopters because they're going to see students vacating our buildings and walking out. Can we get Ted Lu to come? He won't even take a meeting with us. He's giving us his representatives. Lori, Lori. 
Jay Leno. Okay. Um, I just said that, yeah. Yes, let's take a couple more questions. It's kind of getting late, but uh, we'll finish up real quick. As far as the staging area that Jay was talking about right now, like what, how, how are we mitigating some of this even right now? Like you, your third floor and second floor patios are open. The kids walk up and down the driveway to and from classes, from science building to, you know, the bungalows. What, how, what are we doing right now like to even keep my daughter healthy and all the other students and teachers that attend here? I mean, what are, are you guys, do you guys smell things right now? Yes, I do. I, I, mean, I know my daughter is in, a, in two bungalows for classes and she, I she smell, hears things. I smell them everywhere. And she's in, are you in the second row? Not the, the no. So how, how are you guys? Oh, so a couple things. Number one, they don't start the actual process of going underneath. Um, I don't. I know. I'll get to that in a sec. They don't start that process until around eight, nine months. So this is all preparation for now in this long period. In terms of mitigation, um, Mr. Todd, you can correct me if I'm wrong after this, but they have submitted but in the MOA with the city and in court, they, they did say that they will do they will um, they will do what they can to monitor the health and like what's the air pollutants in the air, and that's really it. They're, they just said they were going to monitor it, but since it wasn't enough, and in court they actually said that they wanted more that the health thing wasn't sufficient. But Mr. Tao, okay, you could <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, that um, they. The MOA actually has uh, monitoring requirements for methane, uh, NOx um, particulates, which is PM10s, and um, also uh, hydrogen sulfide. Um, also, they have some controls for noise. We don't necessarily trust that that's actually going to occur. Uh, so uh, if you go, actually you're students, so you can go to the back and take a look. Uh, you'll see cameras pointed at the metro site, multiple cameras. Uh, you'll also see uh, microphones, just like this one, uh, that are pointed at the metro site, as well as a number of air quality monitors. Uh, so we are monitoring continuously uh, for thresholds as of right now. Uh, so we are aware um, our goal is to uh, have the uh, air environment no worse uh, than what it is that you're experiencing now. Because right now, they're technically not in construction. They're only occupying the site and planning. Um, the, um, our understanding of Metro schedule is they're planning on actively starting construction uh, during the summer uh, next year. So that's what we're preparing for. So we're trying to mitigate that as much as we possibly can. We've uh, written letters uh, asking Metro to uh, mitigate, uh, to address sound, to address air quality, uh, and um, that's certainly going to be one of our key requests. Also, uh, we've asked for um, Metro to meet with us with regard to emergency preparedness, and um, I was the one who actually sent out the invite for Metro to come to tonight's meeting so they can address the students, because there's been no meetings for Metro to address anything with regard to the high school, which in my view is the single largest impact. Uh, and the excuse that Metro has given is because we're in litigation, they can't engage anybody associated with the school district or the high school, which we night? don't particularly yeah, buy. Why were they at next night on yeah, Beverly Drive? They engaged with everyone. So, Again, you guys are amazing for taking this on. And I know it's beyond, you guys are leading it, you got other students. A lot of us parents brought our younger kids here that are in middle school or, you know, elementary schools because it's all about social justice. And as we saw with, unfortunately, some of the killings and the shootings in the other schools, it was really the students. The, you know, the parents can fight, but you guys have spoken. So you guys are talking about this walkout. Are we going to get advance notice. I know there's also school district, you know, liability, but I'd like to take my, you know, we brought our son tonight because it's part of it, and I think that there's a visibility there and an important 
lesson and education. Maybe so. we also bring can the bring future kids to high school, school not just the walkout at the high school. Right, right. So the walkout is going to include all five schools. Well, okay, yes. thank you. It is going to impact all kids, not thank only you. high school kids. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, they have. Of course. This, again, I mentioned that all five schools are going to be involved, okay. but that's only because we want committee members of those kids to come out. Well, they're the future. Exactly. Community members, even people who don't live in Beverly Hills, can stand behind the cause. To your question of will, student, will parents be informed? Yes, 100%. We've already s started speaking to this. As long as you're going through five schools, because otherwise it's the high school, and if no. we don't have a kid in the high right. school, we don't know. If it's five schools, thank you. We've I been talking to the city. We've been thank having you. meetings. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's being worked thank out. Thank you. And I, I assure you guys will find out about thank it as you. soon as possible. Thank okay, you. I have a question. I just heard kind of recently that the Metro is also going to be drilling a huge hole in uh, where Moreno is shutting down that street which is going to be a huge inconvenience but i the question is has there been a uh, study of the health and safety risks of that especially to the students and staff that are uh, in the annex right there next to uh, moreno uh, where there's special ed classes well i actually have some news on that um Metro had originally planned on Metro had originally planned on closing Moreno. There, there was what's called a cross station where the uh, two lines need to connect to each other, and their plan was to actually put that directly underneath Moreno. The what they were going to do was they were going to um, dig down uh, for the actual cross path, and um, through uh, city the city litigation and the MOA. Uh, Metro has uh, decided that they will try to build that cross path underground uh, without closing Moreno. So uh, that is actually uh, documented in the MOA that was just recently signed uh, by the city. Go ahead. Can you speak up, please? I have a question that's kind of three far. One is that did the people of Beverly Hills originally approve the route on Santa Monica when they went into uh, litigation with um, Symmetra, that they were going to go through that. Um, did the people, was it actually put to a vote of the people, and the people say yes? Do you remember that? I actually looked at the process. It appeared that uh, for the longest time, what uh, was being represented by Metro to the residents of Beverly Hills was that the route was going to go along Santa Monica. And it appeared that at the very last minute, based on um, review of documents, uh, there was a change. Uh, you can even see that if you go to the uh, you type in purple Google purple line and uh, extension, you'll see all of the documents from when they had those public meetings. They were always along Santa Monica until the very last one. The question is, did the citizens of Beverly Hills approve the metro going through their city? Was it good to vote people? Did not, as I understand it. Was it. Not. Everybody is good, okay. the kids. So then, in other words, the citizens, yeah, everyone is good. Yeah. The people who changed the rally were at the city council. It was, no, no, it was purely in metro's hands. It's completely in metro's hands. How so? This is our land, our city. They don't really have it that work out that way. And the, the plan is for um, just uh, when a transportation corridor is being built, uh, there's a, uh, I, I know this is going to get a little technical, um, there is a pecking order uh, for uh, the most uh, important use or most substantial use. Um, typically schools is top of that list. but. Um, more important than schools in the pecking order is actually, um, or at least a close to equal level, is transportation corridors. So um, when you take a transportation corridor and you compare it against some other use, like say residential, uh, then typically what will happen is the transportation corridor will win in that legal fight. So there's a, um, a method to actually putting that together. Remember, Metro is granted broad authority by the California Constitution, and also they have some federal authority for what it is that they're doing. So in some respects, they uh, have the ability to say, we're going to put the line here, and then change the line. 
Uh, so uh, it's not so much the city's ability to control it, it's Metro essentially telling the city this is where we're going to put it. Put I don't the line. think the city council has all their vigor to oppose this because I believe they are sworn by oath to protect the public and safety of the citizens of the city, which they have totally ignored doing. I, I can't imagine all of these. We went through this years ago with uh, Aaron Brockovich and all the thyroid cancers and all of those things. It's been going around and around, and it's still in the same place. Marvin, I can't answer for the city. So, so these guys, the men of have been doing such a wonderful job. I am just so proud of all of you, and I think they awesome. just continue to go after that city council, too, and shame them yeah. to the fact that they haven't done the things that you are now being obligated to carry for them. And remember, yes, you can do that, but we need your help, okay? And this is a great crowd right now, but word of mouth is very important. Very, I can't stress that enough. Please talk with people you know, friends and families, especially people in this community, because we need that backing. So please, make sure you talk to people. So, any other questions? If the levels go high, do they start? Is there a way to stop them right away? Like, is the independent... Uh, Monitoring, and then can you is there a way to quickly stop them as well as um, have the experts spoken to the judges or have they gone yeah. to court for us? Can the superintendent tell us what is the protocol when it does do that at that moment for the student safety? So, there is an internal monitor through the, the last MOA with the city that um, will be on site and that will be uh, monitoring the levels. So, that person is there. Um, and we'll be we'll be doing some monitoring. So uh, that is what happened in the last MOA with the city. So independent, and then they will come in for stop. It's an independent monitor. The city is paying for the independent monitor. Our city. It's the city of Beverly Hills. Metro. And that there will be one independent monitor that will be stationed at the school district site. Um, there to monitor for methane above 5,500. Uh, the NOx, the NO2, and uh, the uh, PM2.5, the noise, or PM10 and the noise. And if they go over, there's a, what I put up was the uh, uh, fine structure, and the independent monitor does have the ability to actually shut down the project. Sir? Thank you so much. Um, I've got a lot of questions. It's too late. Um, but one comment related to the lady who was just talking about. I was at the city council meeting recently, last with Dr. Perlman, and we were talking about this issue in front of the city council. I mention that because I want to know, Terry, the MOU, the city MOU, the, that the city is supposed to do with the school district that goes to the metro is coming up when? Because that's the clock that's ticking. My understanding was that by the end of this month, I've now been told it's been postponed for another few weeks. Uh, I don't know the date of the... I have it written down somewhere, but I do understand that um, Metro is supposed to vote on this MOA and that the staff is recommending um, signing this MOA. So as far as my understanding is, since it's signed by the school district and the city as of right now, we're just waiting for a signature from Metro's board. That means we're shot through the head at that point, well, correct? Well, well, understand. This is yeah. uh, this is just associated with. Um, it's not an agreement from the school district. It's if they come, then these are the standards that we're measuring them by. So it's primarily a, a deal with regards to what happens with the construction layout site. So we've got to deal with the air quality and the sound issues. Well, my point is that some people have said, I don't want my son going to that school. And I understand, guys, about the, you know, the science of it, uh, with all of this, but I don't want that to happen. Um, I've been through this before, and actually up in Oakland, you mentioned the port up there, I knew about that. And you know what kind of trucks they wanted? Diesel powered. Okay? So we all know that that's not good, all right? We cannot accept this kind of thing. It's got to stop, period, and go back to where she was saying originally, down Santa Monica Boulevard. No questions asked. That's it. Okay. 
Okay, guys. Um, I just want to end it off by saying, all right, we students are in support of Metro. We want Metro to expand. However, if that comes at the risk of students and staff, the health risk of students and staff, we're going to get in front of that issue. We want Metro to go down Santa Monica. Thank you guys for coming. I know it's been a long time. If you have questions, feel free to come up here. But please, please write down. It could be anything that's running through your mind, any recommendations. It could be as simple as, great job. It could be as simple as, why do this? Anything that's in your mind, please write it down outside. Again, thank you. Look forward to more coming out from us. Thank you for coming out. Then I guess. Oh, God. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'd rather talk to you. Oh, the carpet.